campus servos to tell. Let's hear it. A little louder than that. Come on. Yeah. I am an old man. I am really old. <laughs> he says that I've been programming Unix since 1980, but I've been programming since 1969. Next year, that will be 50 years of programming, longer than most of you have been alive, <laughs> and longer than some of your fathers have been alive. For some of you, longer than your grandfathers have been alive. And I've had a wide variety of different jobs. I've been a programmer, a systems administrator, and I have run companies. But open source is even older than I have been programming. It's a lot older than just Linux or even BSD. It has been around for a very long time. I have been coming to Brazil since 1996. And in the first year I came to Brazil, I saw the University of Sao Paulo, 100,000 students, 16,000 PhDs. And there I saw my first Beowulf supercomputer. By the way, next year, Beowulf supercomputers will be 25 years old. And I spin to every FISL, the Software Lever Conference since then, every Latino wear, and every campus party that I could possibly attend in Brazil. In 2002, I helped the Linux Professional Institute bring certification to Brazil. I'm also part of Project Kawan that was created to help you create jobs, to help you create your own business here in Brazil. Since 2011, I've been working with Caninos Lucus, Crazy Canines, and we'll see more about that later. I also am part owner of Hop and Roll Beer Club in Curitiba, where you can brew your own beer, and I think you can see why I like that. In 2017, I married a Brazilian. Most people don't know that, but it's true. And in 2018, I bring you Subatai open source peer-to-peer -peer cloud software, and you will see why that's important. Now, I come from a strange country, the United States. We confuse communism and dictatorships. We confuse capitalism and democracy. We think there's only one form of capitalism, and that's where some rich person owns the company, and they allow you to work for them. But there's many types of capitalism, and you will see some of those today. We have this game called baseball. It's nothing like football. Your game is much better. And we get confused about slavery and freedom. It's so hard to talk about freedom. It's so abstract. But most people can understand the word slavery. Because when you're a slave, you don't own anything and you're told where to go and what to do. And you, you, you're told who to marry and when to have children. And when you're an economic slave, you're told where to buy your software from and how many computers that can go and when you have to upgrade it and when your hardware is no longer any good. These are the things that people who create closed source proprietary software tell you. They make you into an economic slave. 
But we have open source. We have free software. It's free as in freedom, not necessarily free as in cost. Because nothing is free of cost. Not the water you drink, not the air you breathe, and not even your mother's love. Because she will say to you, if you love me, you'll take out the garbage. If you love me, you will feed the cat. You see, even a mother's love has some payment to it. But we give you the next best thing. We give you control over your life because that is the opposite of slavery. Control. You have control of your life. You have control of your business. That is the opposite of slavery. In 1996, I visited Brazil for the first time. I saw the gigantic cities you have. Sao Paulo is the second largest city in the Western Hemisphere after only Mexico City. You hear all the time about New York. New York is way down the line. I saw an entrepreneurial people, a people who like to start their own businesses, and sometimes they're up against great odds. And I also found that Brazil was using GNU Linux more than almost any other country. What I found in 1996 was these very densely populated cities. I saw that a country with half the population of the United States, and yet you were paying billions of reais every year to the United States for software that you could have for free. Now, Brazilians pirate 84% of their software. But even with the 16% that you pay for, that's still billions of reais that you're sending outside of Brazil that could be paid to you to make free software better. It could be paid to you to be a systems administrator of free software. It could be paid to you to create a solution for a customer. But instead, you're sending all of those reais to Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates. And there's only so much cachaça that they're going to drink. For every reai that you send out of the country, it's, it's like sending 10 reais out of the country. Because if you keep that money inside of Brazil, if I pay you to write software for me inside of Brazil, then you use that money to buy local food, local housing, and you pay local taxes. And that money comes back again to buy more software or more hardware. Let's talk about hardware. You're sending billions and billions of free eyes to China every year so that they can manufacture computers for Brazil and for Latin America. Now, I have nothing against the Chinese. I'm not Donald Trump. I think the Chinese are fine people. I go there, they're fine people. I come here, you're fine people. But why should you be sending all of that money to China when you could be manufacturing those computers here in Brazil, here in Natal, and keeping that money and creating great jobs for you. I found that a lot of your companies just buy that hardware from China. It's so easy for them. They buy the hardware from China, and yes, they have to pay a lot of taxes, but they just pass the taxes on to you. And that's why a Raspberry Pi that costs 35 US dollars in the United States costs at least 60 US dollars here. That's crazy. I'll show you later on, we can produce a better computer for the same amount of money. As I said, I live in a strange country and we have this strange game, it's called baseball. And in baseball, you have three bases, and everybody swings at the ball, and they run to get on the base. 
And if all of the bases have somebody standing on them, then a person comes up to hit a home run. They hit the ball so far, it goes out of the ballpark, and this is what we call a grand slam. It is the best thing that can happen in baseball. Everybody cheers, just like you have a goal in football. But baseball is a very slow sport. It takes a long time, and you pay a lot of money to drink warm beer and eat cold hot dogs. We're now going to play Mad Dog Baseball. And the beer is optional. One bad thing about Campus Party, there's no beer. <laughs> so in first base, we have open source software where you get together and you make the software that you need to do your job. You contribute your talents to it. And then you get to use the software that everybody else helps you make. And then you can change that software to meet the needs of your customer. How many of you are happy to own a computer? Good. How many of you are happy to own software? So I assume that everybody who has their hand raised has a nice box of software glued to their wall with a candle on either side like a shrine, because the software is beautiful, like a picture. Or you have a piece of hardware glued to the wall with candles on either side. Nobody has that, unless, of course, your name is Steve Wozniak. He has an Apple I glued to the wall. I don't blame him. Apple Ones are worth a lot of money. But you know, Nobody buys a computer. Certainly nobody buys software. You buy the solution to a problem. Maybe you like playing a game. You want to play the game. That's why you buy the computer. You want to play the game. And if you could play the game using two tin cans tied together with a string, you would. You're solving a problem. You want a solution. That's what the computer's for. You talk over the network. That's the problem. You want to communicate with people. You don't care, really, if it's done with a smartphone. You want to have to solve the problem. And that's what we're doing. And I say you can solve the problem better by using free software than you can with closed source proprietary software. And you can send and keep more money inside of Brazil to give these people jobs. Oh, the Brazilian, oh no, oh no. So we need to teach open source. If you're an educator out there, you should be showing your students how to solve their problems by using open source software. Because open source software can help them solve their problems. But more importantly, they can see how the software works. They can improve the software. They can make it better. And so students learn three times from using open source software and only once using closed source software. Closed source developers may not be able to program in an open source technology because they've never been exposed to the tools or the procedures, the techniques of doing that. And they don't know how the licenses fit together. Dr. Rosalie Lopez of the University of Sao Paulo is creating an online course that's free. And 25,000 people have already taken it. The course is about how to program for the Internet of Things. The Brazilian government has a program. They say we need to train 1% of the population. One out of every 100 people has to know how to program Internet of Things. 
That's two million people. Do you know how many people in Brazil know how to program for Internet of Things? Maybe a thousand. We need to have a lot more, and those people can be you. You can create an industry right here in Natal of how to program for Internet of Things. The Brazilian government says it's a $200 billion market. That's why they're investing in it. In 2002, I brought the Linux Professional Institute to Brazil. All we do is certify people. You can get your training any way you want to. You can read a book. You can look at the internet. You can practice yourself. You can take a class any way you want. And then you take our tests and we certify that you know what to do. And then a customer can hire you to solve their problem. You know, a lot of people talk about favelas. And they say how terrible favelas are. And they think of favelas as having crime. Only about half of 1% of the people in a favela are involved with crime. The rest of them are simply poor. And I've met those people in the favela. I've seen people lift themselves up in the favela. And what we need to do is to train them so they can get a good job. And they can bring money into the favela and wipe out the crime. And I've seen those people, and they're bright. They're smart. And the For Linux company was helping LPI do training of people in the favela. We have certifications today from what we call Linux Essentials, the very bare bones of how to use a Linux system all the way through security, database, DevOps, and other certifications for Linux professionals. We are also branching out to do not just Linux, but open source reaching out to do the Berkeley Software Distribution, BSD, to have them certified also. And we're working on certifications for managers so that we can test whether a manager knows about open source, whether a manager knows about the licensing, that a manager knows how to manage open source developers. And we're also testing for Internet of Things and embedded systems. We believe that it should be the people who are using the software, who are making the software, the professionals themselves, should be determining what their future is. And so we are creating a membership program for certified people to join and to steer our organization I am only the chairman of the board. I am a slave to my members, what they need. And as long as you have that attitude, you will not get into trouble. Second base. Open hardware. In 2012, I brought the Raspberry Pi Foundation to Campus Party Sao Paulo. I begged them to manufacture the Raspberry Pi in Brazil to lower the price to 35 US dollars. And after two years of working with them, they said no. They never told me why. So I went to a little Chinese company called LeMaker and they had a little computer that was much better than the Raspberry Pi. It took me six months to convince them to manufacture that in Brazil. And we had an agreement that we would use their intellectual property. And then when Brazilians manufactured something better or designed something better, the Chinese would actually license it from you. And so you would make money in having products around the world. 
and we felt that we could create these computers much less than they would be sold in other countries. And so we have created the Labrador computer, Caninos Lucus, Crazy Canines. The Labrador is a fun, friendly dog. And it has four cores, 32 bits. It has twice as much RAM as the Raspberry Pi. It has twice as much flash as the Raspberry Pi. It has USB 3.0, which is 10 times faster than the Raspberry Pi. It's got infrared on the board, and it is better in heat, which is necessary in the Dow. The Raspberry Pi goes up to 40 degrees Celsius. This will run at 70 degrees Celsius. And it's better with electrostatic. But it's not enough because Caninos Lucos is actually the recognized hardware platforms for the Brazilian government IoT program. And so we developed this tiny, tiny little computer, which we call the Flea. Then we have the Labrador. And then we have a router that was developed by my company, Optin, and contributed to the program. The, the design specification is up on GitHub. And all of these are going to be manufactured in Brazil using Brazilian components and Brazilian people making them. And then we're going to have designs to come from Brazilian people to be manufactured, and then we're going to sell them throughout the rest of the world. Because it's dangerous to allow any one country to make your computer systems without your knowledge. It's very dangerous. And so by giving an alternative to China, we not only protect Brazil, but we protect the rest of the world from the tyranny of a single supplier. Oh, I forgot one thing. Our router. Our router is not only probably the best router you will ever see but it's also a NAS device, so you can attach this to it. It also is an Internet of Things gateway. You can attach an Arduino shield and a Raspberry Pi connector. But most importantly, it mines cryptocurrency. Very efficiently mines cryptocurrency. So you can do cryptocurrency mining in your own house while the system is doing routing for the same 18 watts. This will be manufactured in the third quarter of this calendar year. So before I come back to Natal Campus Play the next time, you'll be able to buy one of these routers. Third base, open source peer-to-peer -peer cloud software. What's the problem with today's cloud? Amazon, Google, you know, uh, oh, Microsoft Azure, they're all owned by the United States companies. They're under United States law. And in 2002, I started coming to Brazil and I started telling you, I hate to say this about my country but you can't trust us anymore because we're going to spy on you. And people laughed at me. They said, oh, no, no, it's okay. We trust Google. We trust Amazon. It's not Google and it's not Amazon. It's the United States government. And recently they passed some legislation, some laws called the Cloud Act which means that you are in more danger of being spied on than ever. And even if you say, well, I'm using my cloud inside of Brazil, no, you don't know where those packets are going. 
And once they go even close to the United States, that's when the NSA can spy on you. Don't take it from me. Listen to Edward Snowden, who is hiding in Russia because he exposed all of this. And if you think, oh, I have nothing to hide, it's okay. How many of you send sexually explicit pictures to your girlfriends, your wives, and things like that? It's okay. You can raise your hands. I won't take pictures of you. Have you ever done that? Have you ever sent a picture of your naked body to your girlfriend or your wife or somebody like If you have, the NSA probably has it. And they're looking at it, and they pass it around. They do. That's why you have to be in control. You have to run your cloud software. You have to be the person who can sell your resources to other people who need them. So we developed Subutai open source, peer-to-peer -peer cloud software. And this allows the fog, the Internet of Things, which are here and there and every place, to have the processing done on what we call the edge. Rather than send all of that data back to the United States to be processed, it's processed locally here. And you have control over it. You can set up the cloud to do the processing of that data. You can set up the cloud to keep your data inside of Brazil so it's under Brazilian law. Because you know, you can't vote for Donald Trump. You can't vote for Paul Ryan, our Secretary of the House. You can't vote for those people, and they don't care about you at all. It, our software is free and open. You don't have to pay us for it. You don't even have to ask our permission. But it gives you the ability to either save money or make money by using the computing resources you already have. Now the bases are loaded. We have free software. We have open hardware at a reasonable price. Hardware manufactured here in Brazil. But how do we get people to know about this? How do we get people to use it? We use Project Kawan. Project Kawan was created to allow people like you to afford to go to university. Here in Latin America, most federal universities are free of tuition. And if you're a good enough student, you can get in. Or if you don't get in, if the universities are full, you can get a full scholarship to go to a private university. My husband is doing that. This means you literally can go to university for free of tuition. But 40% of the people who qualify for that still cannot go because their families are too poor. They can't afford the apartment in the city the internet, the computer, the books. Maybe the oldest child has been working since the age of 15 to support the family. And that's why a lot of oldest children in Brazil, in Latin America, do not go to university, but their younger brothers and sisters do. Project Kawa can generate enough money by the person working part-time, not flipping hamburgers, not waiting on tables, not working for a hotel, although none of those jobs are bad, but they're not the job you want to do when you get out of university. You want to program. You want to do systems administration. And Project Kawa allows you to earn money doing that. And at the same time, you're helping small to medium business people use their computers better. 
How many of you have been fixing your family's computer since maybe the age of eight? You fix the, the computers in your family. Come on, raise your hands. Don't be lazy. I know you're out there. Look at you. You've been fixing the computers for your mother and your father and your aunts and your uncles and the people up the street since you were eight years old. But you can't charge your mother to fix your computer because it's your mother. It's the person who took care of you when you couldn't even wipe your own butt. How can you charge her to fix her computer? You can't. So the answer is, you fix his mother's computer. <laughs> and he fixes your mother's computer. I'm sorry, Mom, I'd like to fix it, but I'm too busy. You can, he'll fix it, only charge you a little bit. So we teach these entrepreneurs, we teach these students how to start their own business. In Brazil, it's very difficult to start a business. It could take six to seven years just to get through the bureaucracy of starting your business. So we decided not to create one company with a million employees. Instead, we're creating a million companies with one employee. You. You are your own boss. And every single hi that you make goes into your pocket. It doesn't go to somebody else. Well, maybe the government with taxes, but you can't avoid that, can you? So you are in charge of your company, making your money. And this is the way it should be. And we do this with the Micro Entrepreneur Act, created by the Brazilian government, where you can create your own business in one day, for 50 reais. And then you get benefits from having a real company instead of having something under the table. Next year is a very special year, 2019. I will have been 50 years in the computing industry and 25 years with GNU Linux. But the Unix operating system, that is the basis of Linux, started in 1969. The internet started in 1969. People walked on the moon in 1969. Linus Torvalds was born in 1969. By the way, the fact that he's 50 years old makes me feel really ancient. 25 years ago, Linux came out with the first version of its kernel that was good. Beowulf supercomputers happened 25 years ago. The World Wide Web was created 30 years ago. All of these things are coming up next year. And so I want you, Campus Arrows, to tell people about these things, to let them know that computers did not come about by magic. It was a lot of hard work by people who bring them to you. And a lot of that work was done is open source, free and open source software. And we are going to have a birthday party next year a birthday party, a campus party. And I want you all to help me party next year. Because this is not about me. It is about you. I am coming to the end of my programming career. I will be 68 years old next year, 69. Yours, your life is just beginning, and you are the ones who have to take control of it. You are the ones who have to decide if you keep shoving money at the United States, who gives you nothing in return, or whether you keep that money inside of Brazil, inside of Latin America, and you create your own economy. 
you have to think about the fact that free and open source software is not just about you, but it's also about your families. It's the future of Brazil. It means that you will have interesting jobs here in Brazil. You won't have to leave to go to Silicon Valley. You won't have to leave to go to, Washington, to Redmond, Washington. You won't have to leave to go to Europe or China because the jobs that are interesting will be here. A survey was done recently, and the survey asked open source developers what was the most important thing to them. And they said the most important thing was working on interesting jobs, was, was working with other intelligent people. And making money was like number four or number five down the list. This is important because when you work with other people who see the vision, who have the knowledge, it's very exciting. I've been working with interesting people for 50 years. There's not been a single day that I have been bored with what I do. I consider being bored the worst thing on earth. It is worse than death. And so, two quotes. There's a song, Mike and the Mechanics, and in that song, he talks about his life, his father. It's called The Living Years. And in that song, he says, do not give up. Do not give in, and you may just be okay. And the second quote is from a personal hero of mine the first modern-day programmer. Of course, the first programmer was Ada Lovelace, the daughter of Lord Byron in 1860. But the first modern-day programmer was Rear Admiral Grace Murray Hopper, who is somebody who I deeply admire. And she said, as an admiral, a ship in port is safe but that's not what ships were built for. Ships were built to go out on the ocean to weather the storms and to make their own way. And that is what free and open source software does for you. It allows you to make your own way. And so with that, I will ask if there's any questions. This is the emblem of our software, Subatai. We're very proud of the fact is named after the greatest general that Genghis Khan had. A general that worked his way up from slavery to being a general who never lost a battle. He rose on meritocracy, the ability to do the job well. And so with that, I thank you very much. I'll try and answer any questions. There's a person with a microphone. Uh, please, can you uh, talk more about Subway, about uh, the interaction with Ethereum, with Truffle, with the blockchain? Okay. Um, Subutai, first of all, there's several different parts to Subutai. One is the peer-to-peer -peer cloud software itself. You put Subutai on your computer and every computer that you wish to share resources with. And then you can make a connection between your computer and all the rest. The connection is very secure. It is, uses encryption 
to make a private virtual network between all the computers. And it's just like using the cloud software that you use from Google or Amazon or one of the others. Now, that's the first one. And that's if you know where all the computers are that you want to do that. For example, if you're in a university, you want to hook together all of your computers to make it easier for the students to use the resources of all the computers, or a hospital, or a large company. But if you do not know where those resources are, or if you want to sell some of your resources to other people, we have a piece of software called the Subutai Hub. And that is software that you license from us and that we have a business model that you give us a tiny, tiny little bit of the money you make for the service of doing that. But you don't need that software to use the Subutai cloud software. The third part is our blockchain router. The blockchain router is a router just like you have in your home that you use for Wi-Fi or something like that. It has a number of connectors for RJ45, the hardwired Ethernet. And it has uh, Wi-Fi 802.11, BGNN. Now that's where a lot of routers stop. Sometimes the routers allow you to attach a USB disk drive and you can store your data locally. And that's important because maybe you're in, a, in, a, in an area that your internet is not the best in the world, but you want to store your pictures and your videos and things like that onto your computer. If they're stored on the router, then the router can deliver that video any place in your house at tremendous speeds, <coughs> not limited to what your internet provider has. <coughs> and it also cuts down on the amount of traffic to your internet provider so that you don't get as much of a charge for your internet. <coughs> Sorry. The, the third thing the router does is act as an Internet of Things gateway. So a lot of people are experimenting with Internet of Things using Arduinos, and they build an Arduino shield to attach to their things. Or they use the Raspberry Pi, the GPIO pins, to attach to their things. We have the GPIO pins, and we have a place for the Arduino shield. <coughs> and our router, oh, thank you. Our router can actually attach to the shield or, or attach to those things and uh, drive those systems. Our router is also very secure. It uses what we call fuzzy logic to look at every packet that's going into and out of the router. And that allows us to see if there are any viruses or see if there's a denial of service attack or something like that. But the last thing our router does is it allows you to mine cryptocurrency. So today, if you're trying to mine Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency, you have a choice of using the regular CPU, which is very slow. Nobody does that anymore. Or a GPU, which is a lot faster, but they use a lot of electrical power, maybe 1,000 watts or 2,000 watts. Or you use an ASIC, which is a special chip only made for doing that. And the problem with using an ASIC is that if the cryptocurrency changes you have to throw your ASIC away. And there's a company that recently generated $23 billion of ASICs, and they're useless even before they shipped. So we take a middle road. We use something known as a field programmable gate array. It's like an ASIC, but you can change the configuration of the FPGA. It's almost as efficient as an ASIC, but you can change it to meet your needs. And our router has one of the fastest, best FPGAs on the market built into it. We are producing this at the University of Sao Paulo as part of the Caninos Lucos project. 
And our intention is to actually distribute this router almost at cost to allow people to do more and more crypto mining. We are bringing out our own cryptocurrency called the con. Every time you say the word con, you have to say it like that. See, you're not allowed to say con. You have to say con, OK? And that's the uh, cryptocurrency. I'm going to be speaking at a couple cryptocurrency conferences here in Brazil in the next couple of weeks, talking about the con and how it fits in. The con, con is really a uh, utility cryptocurrency. And it's to be used like regular money. And we want to have uh, microfinance, allow microfinance to happen. So, you know, we say to people, use the con to buy everything. Gum, you know, anything you want. And we will have lots of things that you can buy with con to be able to utilize them. Is there anything else you want me to you want to know? Oh, blockchain in a box. Okay, so when you're using blockchain, uh, what happens is that you may use something known as a smart contract, or you may want to do some type of programming with the blockchain. But if you do this and you immediately apply it to a real blockchain, you could have horrible things happen. So we create a virtual environment, which is which a virtual blockchain that you can practice with your smart contracts to see if the smart contract is working properly. And, so, and we make this available for free. Anybody who downloads the Supertize software would be able to use blockchain in a box. And of course, the Supertize software itself is free. Okay, anything, anything else? You're welcome. Anybody, oh, wait a minute, let me put my, is, is it gonna be English or? Portuguese. Oh, English. Or Portuguese. No, it's going to be English. Uh, I'm Where are you? Okay. Yeah. I'm Baesi, and first I want to thank you to come to Brazil so often and to work with us to uh, better help our country. And then uh, I want to ask you, I'm a teacher, and I want to know how could I bring the Kawan project to my students? Okay, so the question is, how can I bring the Kawan project to my students? We have a website which describes the Project Kawan in great detail. Um, I've been so busy over the last six months with, with Supatai that I haven't spent as much time with Kawan as I want. But basically, what we have on the website is a contract which has been looked over by a lawyer in Brazil. We have some uh, marketing materials that you can pull down. You can put your name, your address, your contact information. And in the contract, you also put your name, your address, and contact information, and the name and the contact information of your potential customer. What we do with Project Kawan is we work with the students so they can figure out what their skills are. Students come to me and they say, oh, mad dog, I don't know anything. I say, really? Have you ever put a new disk inside your computer? Oh, yeah, I do that. Have you ever installed a new version of the operating system? Oh, yeah, I do that. Have you ever set up a router, a wireless router for you? So, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Have you ever looked at the error logs of your system to see if your disk is going bad or your disk is filling up? Oh, yeah. Well, guess what? Business people can't do any of that. <laughs> and all of that is valuable to them. So you work with the students so they figure out the things that they feel comfortable in doing. And that's what they put into their contract. And they say to their customers, these are the things I can do. And I will come to your business every, you know, four hours every week and do these things to make sure your computers are working well. And the, the customer can ask them questions that the students may or may not be able to answer like if there's new software that they could be using for their business. And the students can go back and look for that software, that that helps them out. And this is the business that they're in. And what we recommend is about five or six customers where the students are spending four hours a week. And so that's about 24 hours a week. 
and they should be able to earn somewhere around 1,000 or 1,500 reais each month which is a fairly good amount of money for a student. In addition to that, as a long-range goal, we're, we're creating a program that the students can, can change the way that computing is done. This is a much longer discussion. This is like a five-hour discussion of Project Cowan itself, which I'm happy to have with you. <laughs> okay, And we can set that up, so see me after the talk. Okay. Next question, please. Okay, where's the person with the microphone? English or, or? Oi, oi, ah. Wow. Can be in English. You understand me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, two questions and one wish. First, and. Uh, how you see this project here in Brazil in the many years ago for, for, no, for now? And uh, the second question is, how can we do more of these projects? Not only what you showing us, but another, uh, sorry, back to Portuguese. <laughs> uh, how can we do more from these projects? Not only this, but another revolutions of this technology and projects from Brazil for other countries, how you can do. And my wish is to share a bit with you. <laughs> my, my, your, your wish is what? Share a beer with you. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, for this campus party, normally I stay at campus parties for the whole week. But for this campus party, I have some other events that I have to leave as soon as this talk is over. So I, I would love to have a beer with you. And uh, you'll have to invite me back to Natal, and then we will have that beer. Or you can come to Curitiba, to my brew pub, where we have 29 beers on tap. 29 craft beers. No skull, no Brahma, no that. No. They tried. They came to us. They offered us 50,000 reais to put one tap of their beer. And we told them no. <laughs> As to your other questions, each project has the ability to allow you to give input. We're in the process now of creating a community around Caninos Lucas. We're creating a community around Subatai. We're creating a community around the various parts. And as far as taking Brazil to other countries, because of the Mercosur Agreement, we're going to be able to take these computers and sell them to Argentina or Uruguay cheaper than they can buy them from China. And I know of groups in these countries who want to do the same thing. So I'm going to encourage them to join these projects and contribute their ideas to open hardware and, of course, open software. As far as building a, a business on top of what we've done, that's what we want you to do. We want you to look at these projects and figure out how can you make a business out of this. That's why we're doing this. The founder of the Subatai project, his name is Alex Karasulu. He's my chief technical officer. And Alex has been working for the Apache Foundation almost from its beginning as a volunteer contributing his code. Sally Karasudi, our marketing director, is the marketing director for the Apache Foundation. And these people believe not just in making a living with free software and open source, but they believe that what we're doing is going to help other people. I have people come up to me at, at, at events, and they say to me things like, Mad Dog, 
I listened to you 10 years ago, and now I own my own company. I employ 60 people. Mad Dog, I listened to you five years ago, and I convinced my company to do open source, and now I'm the chief technical officer of my company. Mad Dog, I created some hardware that if I had to buy the hardware tools to do it, I couldn't have done it. But I used open source tools to create my hardware and now I have a company producing phenomenally expensive, well-done hardware. And one last one. Recently, I had a man come up to me and said, Mad Dog, I listened to you 25 years ago, and I just sold my company for $2 billion. So he's not just the 1%. He's the half of 1%. So those people that tell you that you can't make money with free software, you can't make money with open source, they either simply don't know what they're talking about or they're liars, one of the two. <laughs> I'm proud that I helped these people. I am proud that these people did that. And it's not just them, it's many more. To answer your question. Okay, next question. Okay, there's a person here. Oh, you're waiting for the microphone. No, no, I can hear you, but this, the translator can't. I could have asked them, my friend, but I want to know from you. What is the history behind Mad Dog's nickname? <sighs> oh my God. What is the history between, behind Mad Dog's nickname? You're looking at a man who is 68 years old, close to 68. But when I was 27, I didn't have as much control over my temper as I do now. I still have the temper. I still get angry. But I've learned to control it more because when you lose your temper, you lose the argument. And so now my job is to make other people lose their temper. I do that by being right all the time. <laughs> I was always right before, but I lost my temper, and then I lost the battle. So I tell you, practice. Don't lose your temper, okay? How did, they, how did Mad Dog come from that? One time I had an argument that was so hot. It was too hot for Mad Dogs and Englishmen. And the person I was having the argument with was British, so I must have been the mad dog. My students gave me the name, but I've kept it so that I don't lose my temper, ever. Any other questions? Okay. In English. Um, mad dog, my name is Mate Mateus. And I can, I wish to ask you if you, you, you will are here in Brazil in November um, and I can ask you if you wish to. Would you like to say this in Portuguese and I can have it translated? Uh, eu queria perguntar para você se você vai estar aqui em novembro. E se você desejaria vir aqui para novembro, aqui para Natal em novembro, é, para um evento da, do Pote Livre? My calendar is very complex, so I can't stand up here on the stage and say that I would be available to come to your event. I come to Brazil a lot. I come to Latina Wear, which is about that time. So the best thing to do is to send me an email message now so I can tell you if I'm able to come to your event. And once I have committed to come to your event, then I will come. But I am also like a vampire. 
I only come into your house when you invite me. And the, the invitation has to also include an airline ticket and a hotel. So, you know. Next question. Only one more question, they say. One more time for one more question. Uh, Matt Dog, I want to know how can I convince people, what, what strategies can I use to convince people to use free software and uh, to convince them that free software is much, much better than closed source software? It depends on who you're talking to. I mean, if you're talking to a programmer, they are already, a lot of them are already familiar with free software. They use it in some way, shape, or form all the time. If you're talking to a business person, I've learned over the years that you never get a business person by telling them about the glories of free software or how they can look at the source code because they just don't care. There's only one thing that a businessman cares about, saving money or making money. And there, you can show them. You say, here, you can either pay for this software that's very expensive, that you can't change, that every once in a while, you need to upgrade your hardware, even though your hardware is perfectly good, or you can use free software. And they'll say, well, I have to learn it all over again. You only have to learn it once, and then it's good for the rest of your life. I've been using the same operating system, effectively the same operating system since 1980. Unix, then Linux. I've never had to go through a massive training or anything. And besides, that's what they pay you for. <laughs> so you get them to understand how much money they would save over time by using free software and the capabilities they would have. Go to sites like Red Hat or some of the other distributions. They have case studies there that show big companies and small companies using free software. It doesn't have to be Red Hat. It could be Debian or something else. And that's, you can use those case studies to convince people to use free software. I've been talking for 25 years about the use of Linux. There's lots of videos that are up on the net. And they always say the same thing. Save money or make money. Give students a better chance to understand how the software works. Software, free software is the great democratizer. It doesn't make any difference whether you live in the Tao, Sao Paulo, any place on earth. They say that when you're on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog. It's true. Nobody knows where you are. They don't know if you're black or white, female or male, young or old. Show me the code. It's the only thing they care about. Thank you very much. <laughs> really?